Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Black Women's Hour. Today I have the lovely authors Jane Evans and Carol Russell, who are the authors of this book, Invisible to Invaluable. And I must say that this book is speaking to me. <laughs> I got it at this right time of life, definitely. Um, so ladies, you wrote this book over lockdown, over that's the first right. one. Yes, that's right. The March I, lockdown. Yeah. I, I'm definitely saying this book is speaking to me. It is about um, sort of middle-aged women, isn't it? And about how we suddenly we become- midlife. Midlife women. <laughs> how we suddenly become invisible to the world, which I am, yeah. I am uh, feeling a bit myself. <laughs> I was saying to Jane earlier, it's really interesting because just as I'd opened it in my friend's car, I was in London last week, it just arrived. I took it on the train with me, just started reading it. And then my co-host who's normally with me, my trusty sidekick, I call her Aisha, um, she sent me a text and went, look at this outfit, am I too old for it? I was like, oh, I've just started reading the book. No, no, you're not. The outfit looks great. Um, it, it's interesting with one of these because I don't really have to ask what the inspiration is for writing it because I'm essentially living it. Yeah. Um, but what would you tell other people who, who don't know? It's interesting because I'm not the age where I don't tell my age anymore. Do you know what oh. I mean? I find all these things are starting to happen to me. And then I'm always checking to see how old I look. And I'm always like, you know, when you see on Facebook and you see fe people's pictures pop up and I look and I think, do I look as old as that? Do I look, you know, it's mean? so age is something that I'm very, very conscious of. Um, definitely. Really You're in your forties though, yes? Yeah, 45. In your forties, it's a very different. It's a very different story than in your sixties, in your fifties and sixties. Yeah. So, um, like the majority of, of cosmetic surgery is done on women in their forties. Um, right. So basically, when you get to your fifties, it there's a more of an acceptance of it. Um, and again, I think after menopause, you really come into your power in a way that you have never before in your life as a woman. And so, you know, all of those wrinkles and all of that stuff, and do I look old is sort of out the window because it's like, you know, you've got all this new testosterone, you're filled with confidence. It's like, you know, you're ready to take on the world again. So um, it, there is a massive difference um, between, yeah. you know, this fear of aging and then hold on a minute, I've actually now, you know, what other people would, could call old and this isn't anywhere near as bad as I feared it would be. Yeah. I mean, what I got from the book, like, and we've said already, it's like, we're definitely not our mums. And the thing is, it's, it's really interesting because I had my first child, I got pregnant at 17, and I had my last child 12 days before my 40th birthday. So I am very, so I've been a teenage mum and a geriatric mum. That was a shock when I found that phrase out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that was literally yeah. A doctor walked a oh, geriatric mum. I was like, what did you say? Um, prima gravid, no, not even a prima gravida, because that was your second child, wasn't it? No, yeah. my third. Your my third, third, right, okay. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, and I was saying like, you know, with, with my first daughter, she passed away, but like, you know, it was very much almost like, you know, people were saying we're sisters all the time. We don't get that, me and my younger daughter, obviously. Um, but yeah. <laughs> oh, I get, I, get, I used to get in shops. I, my, my, my daughters I had at 36 and 39. And, you know, I actually had in shops, oh, you're here with your grandma. Okay. <laughs> I heard, I was like, mm, okay, so you might have been a young mother and you might be a grandmother, but please do not presume that I'm one too. Yeah. So, I had my own. But again, you know, in this life, we can be grandmothers and we can be new mothers. Exactly. Um, and again, that's, you know the perceptions you know we've got to widen the perceptions of who midlife women are um you yeah. know one of the things i say is whenever there's an article on midlife women they show a picture of helen mirren she's 75 yeah. it was like you know midlife is the spice girls you know yeah. missy Elliott. you know it's, it's 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 a very you know and again it's sort of young it's always been young and old yeah. and actually we're, now we're going to be living so much longer um, you know, I certainly know, you know, all of my life, we, 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 we thought we were going to be living till 70. We had paid our pensions for when we were 70. And now we're finding that we're going to live till 90 or, met, you know, even healthy boomers, they're saying, could live to 120. Yeah. Um, you know, we are nowhere near old yet. 
um, you know, and you know, we're going to have to work till we're 70. So, you know, we've, we've got to change the, the fact that it's no longer just young and old. There is now the middle and we should actually be looking forward to the middle. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I found, I remember with my younger daughter when I went to a secondary school and I was just like, why is everyone telling me I look well? Everyone keeps saying, you look really well, you look really well. And I said to her, what's going on? What did you do? And she said, oh, mum, I told them you're 42. I went, why? She went, it's embarrassing having such a young mother. <laughs> and so I spent quite a few years wanting to be older and wanting to be taken seriously as a mother. Now I'm like, no, I don't want it anymore. So yeah, it's definitely, definitely very confusing. I think it was, um, even in popular culture though, there is, uh, you were speaking a lot about actresses and there was just basically the teenager, stroppy teenager, grandma, um, you know, I can't remember all five of the categories that you gave, um, but there were only certain roles for women. I do think with um, pop culture now, is a little bit kinder, would you say so, to women who are getting older? I, I think it is getting kinder. I, because people like, for example, Kate Winslet wouldn't have been allowed to still be acting and having sex scenes back in the yeah. day. Um, I'm just hoping that that carries on because my concern would be that we slip back to a place where it's just young and as Jane says, old, and the middle isn't, isn't being taken into consideration because the middle is so much longer now than it ever was before. Mm. And we, we are stronger now than we've ever been before. And so we can work longer than we ever have before. And so, yeah, if we want to work, we should be working. Yeah, I definitely think it's uh, kinder to sort of richer women though. Like you have the whole real housewife franchise, you speak about Kate Winslet, you speak about, you know, you see all these actresses and it's like, oh, they look amazing. She's amazing for 47, 48. Halle Berry's 53, still doing bikini shots. But like, um, I, I don't know. I think there is definitely a pressure if you are, non-famous to make sure that you look a certain way and you still look youthful and you still and is as you said in the book it's like I'm actually becoming my most useful I'm becoming my most calm I'm becoming my most confident I'm becoming yes. you know where I can actually sit and evaluate and I've learned a lot of things and I've still got a lot of things to offer um so I saw that you used uh, real life cases as well um like yes. Diane Abbott who I'm a great fan of as well. Um, what I wanted to ask you, you speak about women needing to group together and I found that really interesting because this week, I don't know if you guys do social media at all. Yes. So you spoke about us going forward as women and the need for <laughs> us to uh, band together. And there is quite a lot of, con not controversy, conflict maybe at the moment between women's women of different races. And what I did appreciate about the book was you do acknowledge white privilege, which um, a lot of people don't. And there was a TikTok that was out this week. I don't know if you ladies saw it and it was of white women crying. No, I missed that yeah. one. I'll go find it. <laughs> so basically it was white women. It, it was like, they'd all have, they were all on TikTok and it was like cry and they would cry. And then someone goes, now turn it off. And they all of a sudden stop crying. And you know, sort of the controversy with white women's tears and stuff. So I found it really interesting. I mean, do you want to speak a little bit about that? Because you are a black writer and, and obviously a black and white writer. But I did um, like sort of where you'd sort of put clauses in and said, you know, well, life became a bit better for women. And you put white women. You were very specific about that. I mean, I know myself from reading, but, you know, do you want to speak a bit about that and why that was included or how you guys felt speaking together about it? Um, I think because Carol and I have had the tough conversations. Mm -hmm. It was Not like, all of them. All... we ain't finished yet. No, no, that's right. It's like, <laughs> we, we've never been afraid to have the conversations. 
and we've had uncomfortable conversations and you know i think i think that's been you know a major part of it is is that you know we're saying to other women you've actually got to have these conversations that we've had yeah and for me it was because because jane is a woman who was racialized as white and because in the western world white is the so-called norm Jane yeah. would talk about women as if she was talking about all women, but she wasn't talking about all women. So when we were having these conversations, and the reason why we'd be having these conversations is because I'd say to her, Jane, Jane, you're just talking about white middle class women. What about white working class women? What about white women of color? What, uh, what about um, women of color? You're just talking about white working um, middle class women. And she'd go, Oh God, yeah, I suppose I am, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, thank you, yeah, I'll take that on board. And she does, and that is, so we'd have the conversations about why, we'd have the conversations that were about um, the differences. So what her experiences were when she entered the workforce and what my experiences were when I entered the workforce and how different they looked at that time. Yeah, yeah. I definitely had learned some stuff um, I didn't even know there was theatre in Jamaica. Um, yes. And I did, obviously, you know, we've got the great uh, Black Power, which has been out, and it's, you know, we had Subnormal as well. And we really spoke about those sort of harder things that Black women had to go through. Yeah. Do you think there'll ever be any kind of meeting of the minds between women? Because I'm, I don't know, I mean, I, I kind of, as I was reading, even the chapters where you were saying, oh, oh, we've got to do everything, we've got to, you know, consider what white women's experiences were and stuff like that. And I must say, I did feel that little rising in my stomach where I thought, am I supposed to feel sorry? <laughs> <laughs> I was, like I did, because you do feel like, you know, what we've been through as black women and continue to go through is so much harder. You know, and I, I kind of, it really made me open my mind when you spoke about white women being seen as pure, how their image went from tempting whores, basically, to being pure and how, and I was like, am I supposed to feel sorry for that? You know, and I did look at how it, it makes life different for everybody around them because of that. But then you see a crying video like that. And then you see stuff like Fleabag, which is funny, but you kind of feel like, so these women know that they're very, very privileged and they don't seem to really care. I mean, do you think we're, we're getting closer or not? I think that it is possible for us to get closer if we are willing to have the conversations. If, if all of the people who were out um, on protests with us last year all of those white women who were out there, you know, saying Black Lives Matter and no justice, no peace. If they really mean it, then they need to, they show us by being willing to learn about our lives and the history out of which we all come, which was the reason in that particular chapter that you were talking about, that I put that change, how, white women went from being the temptress, the Eve in the garden, the snake, to being pure. And, and the thing that actually, one of the things that actually drove that was the fact that black women were being enslaved. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it, for me, I want, what I wanted to, what I wanted to do, because what me and Jane wanted to do was to show, was to bring together our histories and then say, look, look at both of them side by side, because we never get to see our histories side by side like that. No, that's what I found really interesting about it. We really, really don't. They're just spoken about, you know, so both of them exist in a vacuum. Exactly. Definitely. And so it's, it fit it to me, it's it, women who read this book. My hope is that women who read this book see and go, I didn't know that that was going on as well. I may have known that this thing was going on for my um, uh, so-called race of people, yeah. but I didn't know that this was what was going on for women who we'd racialized as black. Yes, yes. 
I think also in the book, um, you know, we talk about like the difference in ages too, that, you know, yeah. that, we, that women of all ages need to come together as well. Um, I had a really interesting experience earlier in the week. I went for a facial, which I haven't done for ages. And, and I was like, I, and she started talking. I just went, hold on a minute. If we say any more, I'm an ages, I'm an age campaigner. So please do not say anything ages to me. And you can see the woman sort of going, oh shit. But, but, but she managed it. It was like, you know, you could actually see that she was going through the script in her head that, oh, hold on a minute, I can't say anti-aging, I can't say anti-wrinkles. So, you know, and you could actually see her sort of like stop and go, okay, so sun damage, um, you know, and, and you could actually see her really genuinely making an effort. And I think, you know, again, it was like, if we point out what it is that you, you know that we're offended by or, or or you know isn't working for us if we actually communicate that really well people will actually learn how to communicate to us without being you know bigoted yeah. so do you both find that you do that in everyday life do you stop people correct their language a lot yeah okay. I, I do actually yes i do i do because <laughs> i've recently become uh, involved in um various projects that are around getting rid of that acronym BAME. Oh, used to be my username on Twitter. No <laughs> such thing as BAME. Just Thank you. Me. I mean, honestly. And so now I, pref I prefer people either say which particular, um, which particular eth ethnic diversity they're talking about or they can say an ethnic, these are for ethnically diverse people. So if they're talking, if, they, if it's a collective, ethnically diverse is fine for me because it doesn't make me the bane of anybody's existence. Yes. And it doesn't, and, and it doesn't make me um, just a, because it's a lazy term, it's so lazy. And people are always saying, oh, but that means I've got to say everything. Well, yes, you do. You have to say everything. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Call me what I am. I'm a woman of African descent. That is what I am. Yes. Well, exactly, because our experiences are so vast. They're so different. And there is a hierarchy of race, whether the Labour Party want to say there is or not. And um, I found when my username was, there's no such thing as Bane, I was answering like a thousand times. I found this essay by somebody, a psychologist called Dr. Christine George. And I would, it was, you know, going, don't call me BAME. And I just would send that out to people all the time because it is a very lazy term and it does center whiteness as, as normal, you know? And, and that is something that I found quite obviously annoying. It was almost like, oh, I mean, when you think about it, it's absolutely outrageous that you've got a term for everything but white. You know, it's so rude. It is so rude. And we do have such different experiences. And last week we had a journalist on Anna Chen and another journalist, Annie Ma, and we were talking about cynophobia. And it was such an interesting conversation because you don't think, I said, my God, you know, as a black woman, we're fighting all the time for representation. And they were talking about the two Chinese actresses that were well known as they grew up. And you don't look at it from that perspective. You know, you don't look at it from, because black people have always been very vocal. And I do agree with, we're not anybody else's mule. What we've got, we've fought very, very hard for. And other people have to, but it was very interesting sort of drawing the parallels. And yeah. also the other thing that you guys do in the book, which is really interesting, is drawing parallels between ageism and racism and sexism. Yes. You know, those are things, you don't think of it like that as you're growing up. You think of racism as this big societal problem. You think of ageism, you just think, oh, well, you just get older and you just shuffle off somewhere and you just keep quiet. But it really isn't that at all and it affects people in so many different ways. It really does. And it, like all of the other isms, it's, we're talking about the structural nature of ageism and how it affects um, how it affects our ability to work. Yes. Because it's the fact that, you know, by the time we're kind of, if we're getting up to 50, there's a, there's a fear that we're about, the next round of redundancies in our office is going to see us being the first ones to go. Yes. Definitely. So it's, it's, we have to, we have to see the systems that, that 
uphold ageism and dismantle those in the same way as we're working to dismantle uh, racism, we're working to dismantle um, homophobia, and we're working to dismantle ableism. Yeah, and some of the other ones around the edge that I'm not, I haven't, I haven't mentioned yet. But also, the other thing is, is that ageism is the only ism that we'll all suffer from if we're lucky. Yes. Yeah. And so, you know, actually, if we can frame the argument in ageism, you can't, you, you know, it, you can't remove any of the others from it because whether you're black, disabled, gay, whatever you are, you know, you are going to reach a certain age and then you are going to be hit with this one. Um, I find it really fascinating that the, 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 the people that can't cope with it the most are white men. Um, yeah. because this is the first ism they have ever experienced in their yeah. life mm. and they have no idea how to handle it I mean you know again in the book I sort of go guys with my tongue what, very you mean perfect. white straight men though Jane white, oh yes no white straight men thank um, you but also to it uh, uh, I have actually found uh, white gay men as well who've, who've realized that they were part of the patriarchy and rode along with the patriarchy yeah um, you know, so, you know, I don't, I, you know, yes, I am talking white straight men, but there are also, you know, quite a few white gay men that, um, you know. No, that, I mean, when, no, I mean, when you say it's the first ism yeah. that they've yeah. suffered from, get oh, yeah, white no, gay no. men, it's not the first ism. No, no it's not the first ism that they've, they've These they've, are the kind of conversations that we have. This is yeah. how we talk. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> how we um, talk. But, you know, but, but, you know uh, in the book, we sort of say, let's be a little old fashioned about this. You know, it was like, open the door, ladies first. We know how to handle this because they're all coming out going, oh, it's because we earn too much money and blah, 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 blah. And it was like, no, that is nothing to do with it whatsoever. Um, and again, they come out with this absolute sense of privilege um, ent entitlement that you know we should we, we, you know my goodness we're getting ages and we're not supposed we're not you yeah. know we're not supposed to have an ism against us yeah. um, so I find that absolutely fascinating um, that you know as I said we, we all will suffer from it and you know this is actually a great opportunity for us you, you know you can't pick your ism it was like if you're going to fight for one you've got to fight for all of them so you can't be a white straight male going oh i'm an anti-ageism campaigner but you know stuff women and black people and gays and trans you know yeah yeah, yeah. yes i definitely yeah i find that as well what well, i was very relieved sometimes you, you're going to interview people on this and you had uh made a comment about jk rowling in the book and uh, I thought, oh God, they're not transphobic. Thank God, thank God. <laughs> I had a lady on here, um, she also called Jane, her son, uh, Jane Oz Ozam. And she was, uh, she just uh, resigned from the Tory LGBT advisory panel that week when we had her on the show. And I thought, oh my gosh, because she came to me very late. We were talking about conversion therapy and just the relief when she turned out not to be transphobic. Cause I was thinking, oh my God, I didn't know this woman was a Tory. If she's <laughs> transphobic, what are we going to do with this? What are we going to do? We're going to have to get her off the show. We're going to have to get her. But she absolutely wasn't. And I was really relieved um, uh, that you guys were transphobic. And you no. were, I mean, do you want to speak a bit about that? Because that is raging on. And it's, you know, there's been the Court of Appeal case with, oh gosh, what's her name? Miriam, My Myra Forrester. Have you seen that court case this no, week? Well, yeah, no, had, she lost her job for transphobic things she was saying online. And she's taken it all the way to the Court of Appeal today, uh, this week. And it was quite a bad um, sort of result for trans people because it was basically saying transphobia is almost an opinion. I mean, I, why did you ladies feel, explain why you feel the need to, can, to include trans women in this? Just for people who don't know, I know, obviously, but it is something that rages on that I obviously have zero problem, you know, with people. And also there was Chim Chimanda. Chimamanda. Uh, Chimamanda. Yeah, Chimamanda. Did you see what she wrote this week? No. She wrote an essay, it was put on a website, it went absolutely crazy, where she got into a sort of altercation with a couple of trans writers in Nigeria. And when I wrote the, when I read the essay the first time, I thought it's beautiful. And it was about online opinions and making mistakes and maybe young people don't feel they can make mistakes. And when I found out she'd done it all 
you know, basically to be transphobic. I was like, well, there's waste of beautiful words. Oh. I mean, do you guys want to speak about how you feel about trans women, the trans community, trans women, and why you feel that you we should be including them in our conversations? For me, for, for most, for most women who are trans women, they have been living, they have been living with that knowledge that so something isn't right mm. and that they're not in their, their, their right place. And so for me, if someone is, has, says, you know what, now I'm going to go for it. I'm just going to go for it. I'm going to live my very best life. Mm. I'm there. I'm there because I have suffered from the, 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 um, the ism that is racism. And I have suffered from the ism that is sexism. And I have suffered from, I am suffering from the ism that is ageism. And so for me, it's really important to support people who are, ha who, who are going through structural isms that try to stop them from living their lives. It doesn't hurt anybody leave people alone and let them live their life i agree for me one of the things you know one of the things about the book for me was this has to be a book for all women so you know this has to be for like the 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 you know the tory woman um you know this has to be for the trans woman um you know and i you know i found it really interesting that we you know when we had the review in the financial times it was like you know we had a fantastic review but she said it might be a little too folksy for some of our readers and it was like great yeah no it probably is a bit folksy for ft readers bits of it but you know it was like you know the crystal lovers in glastonbury are gonna love those bits and <laughs> you know it it is a book for all, you know, we say it's, 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 you know, from the top of a high rise to the top of the corporate ladder. Um, you know, we've actually got to get all women on side, younger, older, um, you know, and again, if we come together as a sisterhood, um, we are terrifying to the patriarchy. And, you know, the patriarchy, you know, it has always tried to pitch us against each other and make competition between, between each other, you know, and, you know, whether you've had plastic surgery or whether you're going natural, whether you're young or you're old, whether you're a professional woman or whether you're on benefits, it was like, you know, whether you're a working mother or a stay at home mother, it was like, you know, oh, we've got to pitch women against each other. And we're saying, look, we're never going to agree on everything, but if we can agree on what we're going to disagree on, let's actually work on the things that we do agree on. Let's, you know, let's fix the things that we, we can, you know, let's find the common ground and fix the things that we can fix. Yeah, definitely, I agree. And so going back to trans women, we had three trans women on the show um, a few months ago. And it's really interesting because uh, Chimamanda had made this sort of, speech on Channel 4 News going trans women are trans women and women are women and actually it was really interesting hearing their childhood experiences because they were not read as boys or as men at all Please. and that's what people don't understand and uh, we had Roz Cavani on and she she said to me like people would say to her mum what is that it's standing wrong it's do you know and we had Claudia in the hall who's like basically uh, walking along the street with her mum in Portugal when she was growing up and someone shouted across the road, hey, there's something wrong with it. What's wrong with it? Do you know what I mean? So there is the, the idea that trans women, I think for a lot of people, Caitlyn Jenner might be, you know, the, the most visible person and the person they've heard about. So they think women, they think that trans women have lived this life of being men and all that it entails and being like a fantastic athlete and read as men and all this. It's just not the case, not the and case. That, yeah, all. that's why I said, that was why I said most, most trans women. Because yeah. I know most trans women have had to, have had to deal with the discrimination as they've grown up. Yeah. So, and, and, and you know, and then, whether they enter their transition or they don't transition, you know, they, their choice, the choices that they make come out of a place of going way back in their lives. This is yeah. not something that, you know, just kind of happened yesterday and they decided. Exactly. Please. Yeah. 
<laughs> face. Don't get me started. <laughs> That's such a Caribbean face. This one. Um, so, I mean, my first experience of sexism, of sexism, ageism, I was actually quite young. I was about 31. I was about 31 and I made a joke. Um, and it was about a song. I can't remember the name of the song now. Um, but it was a boy's own song and someone posted oh, songs. I said, oh, it's Cat Stevens' song, really. And it was on a, a, a guy who liked my comedy. It was on his page and his friend was like, yeah, so what? Just because you're old. And I was like, mate, like, are you <laughs> kidding me? Like, it's just a Cat Stevens. I said, you're clearly reading. It was a joke. I went, oh, he goes, yeah. I said, oh, maybe I'm showing my age. He goes, yeah, because you're old. You're old. I was like, but as you said before, what's the alternative? I mean, for anyone, what, what, what was your first where you thought, oh, that's strange. Do you know what I mean? Like, what was your first yeah. really memorable? Um, for me, going into I've the phone been... shop. Sorry, it was going into the phone shop and the young black man who was serving me calling me auntie. auntie. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, that's uh, the thing. Me, that was, yeah. I've faced ageism all the way through my career. And I think, again, people, people mistake ageism for just being old. So, you know, at the start of my career, I was too young. So for the first 10 years of my career, I was too young. Um, and I started, I started my career at 20 years old. So most people, I was four years, you know, younger than most people when they started their careers. So, you know, all the time in my 20s, even though I had, you know, eight, nine, 10 years experience, particularly at the end of my 20s, I was too young to, to be promoted. Yeah. Then in my 30s, I was too likely to have children to advance in my career. And then in my, in, in my mid 40s, I was too old to have a career. So I was, there was never a sweet spot for me, ever. Mm. Yeah, that's it. You put it like that, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, definitely. I can see that. And I think, you know, women do something. And again, when, we, when we're saying to younger women, you know, you've got to get on board with this because actually a very dangerous precedent has been set. And, you know, and, and, and you know, when I, when I say to women, wouldn't it be great if you could actually see women picking up their careers at 45, 50 and moving on with them? And the sense of relief from these women is really quite incredible because they feel as though they're under the clock all the time. They've got to get the university degree. They've got to find the, 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 the perfect job. Then they've got to find their, their partner, their life partner so that they can have children. And they've got to get as high up the career path, 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 uh, you know, career path as they can before they take a break to have children. And, you know, and, and it's just rush, 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 rush. Now, if they could see that, you know, women can actually plateau their careers for a few years and then come back and rise, then it gives them space. And it was like, so it's in their best interests as well that they're campaigning for longer careers and, and careers that are based on a woman's biology and not a man's. You know, the current career path is based on a man's biology that, you know, it, at 25, he's at his athletic peak. At 35, you know, he's, he's probably just about to start losing his hair. It was like he's, you know, he's at his, you know, he's at his career peak, um, you know, rising to 55, where, you know, all of a sudden his testosterone and everything starts dipping and dipping and dipping until he sort of like fades out. Now for women, we, we have a completely different experience at that, at that age where we actually, we get a rise, you know, all of the estrogen disappears and we get a rise of testosterone. Um, and our brains actually age differently. So um, a, a, a 50 year old woman's brain is very, very similar to a 25 year old man's. And so, you know, that old thing of, you know, we're looking for some, a 25 year old with 30 years experience. Well, actually that's a midlife woman. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, you know, we, so again, you know, we as midlife women have to actually come out and start shouting about how fucking, oops, am I allowed to swear? Um, no, we had Asha Khan on, it's, it's gone now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's gone. He's gone now. It's gone I now. always ask that question before because I've spent a long time in Australia and their adjectives. But, you know, it was like, we really do have to, you know, be like, we are fucking great. Yeah. And, you know, again, one of the things that comes uh, comes with mid age as well is you really have no fucks left to give. Um, yes. And, you know, you actually do like I don't you don't sweat the small stuff anymore. It was like I really don't care about any of that stuff. 
Um, and that's very, very powerful because we can actually, you know, talk, really talk truth to power with no fear. Um, yeah. And, you know, and again, within organizations and for younger women and in society, younger women do need older women to go and stand up for them when maybe they don't have the confidence or, you know, the experience to be able to do it. Or feel they don't have the power. Yeah. yeah. That's really interesting to me because that's how I feel now. And I am auntie now and I'm, I'm actually embracing auntie. I really, yes. in fact, if younger black people, younger Caribbean or even African uh, people say anything to me, I'm like, if they go Abba, I'm like auntie Abba. Like <laughs> a little bit manners, respect yes. very much. But I do feel like, um, I think it was a Maya Angelou quote where she spoke about, I just love to see a young girl like, you know, grab the world by its lapels and go out and kick butt. Like I really um, find it almost like a duty to speak to younger women because yeah. so much that I've been through. And I remember sitting in a hairdresser in South Africa and um, the conversation turned around to what do, you, what do you wish your mother had told you? And one of the women said, I wish my mum had told me how wicked men can be. Like I just, she just didn't prepare me. I didn't know. And um, so how do you, I feel like it's my responsibility now. Like I will, there's a younger sort of half Dominican girl online who I absolutely adore. And I'll see her saying things. I'm going, oh girl, no, you don't know how lucky you are. You don't know how lucky you are. That guy is gone. Please dry your, like you just don't understand. Do you guys feel that same sort of nurturing responsibility to yeah. speak to younger women? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And as you were saying earlier, I love to see them grabbing the world by its lapels and yeah. shaking the world. I love women like Liv Little who, who, who created um, Galdem. Oh, yes, I've done Oh, I adore her. She is fabulous. Yeah. So yes, I do. So I have, I've always had, um, friends who are 10 years older than me and 10 or more years younger than me. Yeah. And I, I, I tell them my stories so that they can learn in the way that I learned from the women who were ahead of me. Yeah. And what those women did for me was prepare me for every stage of life I was stepping into. And so my <laughs> job is to bring the women behind me and prepare them for every stage of life they're stepping into. And so they know that they can come and ask me anything there is nothing that's going to shock me nothing oh. yeah and um jane did you have because i didn't have that so i find it really important to do it for younger women because i didn't have that kind of mother figure in the end i decided my angelou was my mum, and i would just read her stuff and try and learn off her because i you know i had an auntie and sadly she passed away quite young from breast cancer and she was the one who would speak to me and tell me certain things. And when she wasn't around anymore, then I, I, I know that my life had been completely different had she had lived. Um, Jane, did you have someone showing you the way and how do you feel about sort of teaching younger women? Um, very, very few. I, 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 I had a few mentors in my industry, which I was lucky with. Yeah. Um, but one of the things that I'm finding at the moment, which I find really quite strange, is that, um, and it's it's around cancel culture, that you know, younger, particularly younger white career women, um, feel as though they should gang, you know, should pile on one person. Um, and, you know, we actually had an, a, a, an instance where, where this happened and, um, and they basically turned around and attacked us, um, you know, basically saying, you know, well, you know, we have a right to go after these people. And it was like, you're not listening to women that actually have had massive experience of this over, over, the, over the years. Um, you know, we're sort of saying the whack-a-mole, um, you know, brand of feminism doesn't work. It was like, you know, we need to systematically change it, not just go after this one guy that's done something wrong. This turned into an all on bun fight between me and a couple of, uh, uh, you know, a couple of older women. Um, with the younger women, you know, basically, you know, saying you're not on our side, of which we're just sort of going do you have any idea, you know, what we're doing? And so it was almost like, if you don't agree with us, 
then we're going to attack you. It was like this sort of like, we're not going to listen to you because, you know, we're going to go after this guy because we feel as though we have to go after him. And we're going, why would you go after one when, we're, when we should actually be changing the system? Um, but, you, you know, so I found that really interesting that there is, you know, from younger career women, a lack of respect for women that have actually been through and fighting these fights for years. It's almost like they dismiss it as like, we're the first, you know, we're the first, you know, we're the first ones with power. And it was like, honey, you are nowhere near that. Um, and so, yeah, so I found that really quite interesting, um, just, you know, that, that there actually can be. And I think that comes out of the fact that because we're invisible, they don't realize who we are and what we've done. So, yeah. you know, I, when I do speeches, I get everybody singing Bohemian Rhapsody and everybody sings every single word of it. And then I go, so on the day that became number one, do you know what else happened on that day? And they all sit there and go quiet. I go, we got equal rights legislation into law. The queen signed that into law. And they just sit there with their mouths open. They have no comprehension whatsoever of how recent this history is and that the women who pioneered all the things that these women take for granted are still fighting for their careers and still, you know, nowhere near retirement age yet. Um, yeah. So, you know, so this perception of we're the first, you know, we're, we, you know, we're the ones fighting, you know, nobody else has fought before us. We're just sort of like, oh, for heaven's sake. You know? this, is, yeah. this is part of the, this is part of the structuralness yeah. of, ageism and sexism and all of the isms because what has actually happened is that people have been deliberately encouraged not to look behind themselves not to look at history not to look at what their you know whether it be their mother's generation or the generation before that have done or the, even the half generation that comes behind them so that we are all encouraged to to go for i what i call firstism I'm the very first one to do this. I'm the very first one to do that. And it's like, yeah, no, you're not. I don't know if you saw, I think it was a couple of years ago. It was when um, Stormzy was headliner at Glastonbury and he, he put out the tweet, you know, first black um, headliner at, uh, at, at it was, is it the diamond tent? The uh, main stage. And Skunk and Nancy came and said, no, baby, that was me, 1999. Yeah. Just, and he went, oh, luckily he's the kind of uh, young man who just, he just took it and went, yeah, okay. Thanks for letting me know. Thanks for that. Yeah, no, no, no. Big, yeah, big you up. And I just yeah. thought, yes. And, but that's because we're all encouraged right now to be, in, we're encouraged to think of ourselves as the first. Yes. So all of those young women that, that Jane and the, um, the handful of older w women were arguing with are women who have been encouraged to think that. Yeah. Encouraged not to look beyond their own, uh, look beyond their own time. Mm. Yeah, it's definitely, as you say, it's part of being made invisible. Something that I can sort of relate to that is when I see young black people wearing t-shirts saying we are not our ancestors. It's like, how dare you? How dare you? No, you you're not. Here. You could never be, you know, for what they went through. I mean, just, and I think that that is part of the way that we are educated and stuff. Like, wow. I mean, do you know slaves were cane rowing maps of the plantations yes. on their yes. heads? On their heads. So we could not be <laughs> our ancestors. We could never be. We could never live. There. They would like have food rations in big afro puffs and stuff and sneak it out to the people who were being starved so no and I think there is definitely a lack of respect and that is from not being encouraged and I think it, it I mean it goes through every ism I yeah. mean through, I mean if you look at queer history and stuff if you cannot yeah. look at what went before you and mm. I think there is part of I think it's like you said it's a design isn't it it's a design to not look at what went before you. There's a reason yes. the government are taking certain things out of the curriculum. You're not allowed to talk about how the labor movement started. You're not yes. allowed to talk about trade unions and this and that because they don't want people to know because they know exactly what will happen to them. From and it is that thing of, it, it, it's, it's to stop us coming together because yes. if we, if, which is, you know, going back to the, the, the conversation we were having earlier about women coming together if we knew 
some of the things that were done and, and, and uh, set up it to, to make us not see each other as full human beings, then yeah. we would be, we'd be so angry. We would then turn our anger onto the place where it needs to be. Yeah. Those with the power to make policy to, to, to keep the world as it is. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like I said, don't get me started. <laughs> <laughs> no, stop, stop. It's just a, yeah, definitely. I agree. I totally agree. There are so many barriers between a lot of us. And I think yeah. there are a lot of hurt feelings that have to be. Yes. Like I said, I felt some reading the book. Yes. <laughs> I just thought, and as you read on, you'll see some other, you know, where we talk um, in other places as well about, about that. Because yes, there are hurt feelings. There are yeah. hurt feelings. And, you know, when we, you know, th th there is a reason why there are, we, there are Karens in this world. And there are reasons why w we don't like them people. Yes. And their tears. Yes. Mm. And yes. to give them the mug. <laughs> yes. Oh, I've got one. Have you yes. got one? <laughs> yes. A mug for them tears. So, yes. yes. But I, the thing that I've uh, seen all my life, though, is that I have been in situations, because I, uh, I train as an actor in Jamaica, came back over here and was working um, in youth and community, as a youth and community actor. So I was um, going around doing theater and education and stuff. And I have sat in, in, in what were uh, youth clubs back in the day and talked to people who, when they first saw me, they, all they wanted to do was look, find a rope, put it around my neck and string me up. And, but by the end of the evening, just, just the talking to, I could, the change that happened, you could see that this is fear. You, it's, you've never met anybody like me. That's what, that's what's going on here. You've never met anybody like me. You're just listening to the stories that they're telling you on the telly about people like me. Yeah. And by the end of it, they're going, oh, you know, thanks, miss, you know, thanks, thanks, miss, because, you know, I never met anybody like you, you know, I never met anybody. Yeah, that's right. You never met anybody like me. Yeah. And so well, you I know, idea. Yeah. Exactly. So I know that when we come together and sit and talk to each other as human mm -hmm. beings, we, we cannot but walk away and feel the, 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 our humanity, even if we don't agree with what the other one's saying. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I definitely and again, you know, your earlier point about, you know, not worrying about white women's tears, it was like, we deliberately wrote in things in the book that, you know, it was like, so we talked to the, you know, the, the, the black history, it was like, well, you know, we were burnt at the stake, you know, and it was like, just so that they could actually start to, to to actually start to feel like when they read the black story against the white story that they could actually start to feel you know almost like the the, the inherited memory of it that you know and, and so you know a lot of this the, the parallels that we put in the book it was like you know was was not so much to get white women's tears, but for them to get them to the point where when we actually told the black side of the story, that they could actually understand it on an emotional level. Yes. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I find that I talk a lot about discrimination and social problems and stuff. And I sometimes find it's, it's not, you know, I found myself doing it a lot last week and I was saying to the two women of Chinese heritage, I'm not going, oh, us too. Us, it's not one-upmanship. It's like, I tend to find that is a way that sometimes we can relate to stuff. Yes. Um, so there was so much that they were saying, I was going, oh gosh, us too. You know, about seeing being seen as temptresses and uh, yes. Chinese women sexualized so badly and then black women are. And then this woman was like, how can they want to fuck us and hate us? And I was like, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> slavery, you know, we know, we know. And I, I, yeah, I had to keep saying that was not what it was. When I read in your book about the Salem witch trials and stuff, I didn't know it went on as long as it did. Yes. Yeah. I really had no idea about that. No yeah. idea about that at all. So I and, did, uh, and the law didn't actually change until 1951. Like yeah. the Witchcraft Act was still, didn't get repealed until 1951. It was like, that's, that is absolutely mind blowing. Yeah. yeah. It's still, you know, I mean, it didn't happen, but in the law, it could, it could have. have still been burnt at the stake until 1951. 
<laughs> it's like you said though, like things you don't realize happen quite recently, like women being able to have their own bank accounts. Thank you. And, you know, like, are you kidding me? Like a uh, great within marriage, like that was just consent for life. You know, if you decided to marry a guy, then he could do basically what he wanted to do to you. The one and, that amazed yeah. me a lot was medical, tr medical trials. That wasn't yeah. until 1993 that women were included in medical trials because prior to that, our hormones were seen as being um, too- A too modifier. Um, yep. Yeah. I read yeah. that, but I was thinking black women were experimented on a long time. Mm. Ago. Yeah. And, white women, and Jewish women, before they were racialized as white, well, white Jewish women, obviously as Jewish women. Yeah. Are, yeah. But they were experimented on, yeah. uh, on yeah. a yeah. while back before, you know, uh, yeah. you know, Sister. But there are things that, you know, we actually take for granted yeah. you know, as being societal. So, you know, the reaction to stress is fight or flight. Everybody's heard that, fight or flight. You know, if you, you come up against stress, you're either going to run or you're going to get your fists up. When they did the same experiment with female women and female mice, a new reaction to stress came up, which was tend and befriend. Now, you know, it was like, now that when as soon as you know that you go well that's absolutely obvious if there's you know somebody at the gates that are about to come and attack you can't run you can't you know you're not strong enough to fight so you try and what can i do to appease you you know let me feed you you know you know and and again you know the whole of society is built on fight or flight now if we now add tend and befriend how does that reflect in, in ageism, in racism, in all of those things that where they've been antagonists? You know, in racism, it's, it's slightly different though, Jane, because in racism, yeah. what we've also got is the, um, uh, when we are in the middle of racist trauma and reliving and being triggered, what, what's happening to us is the, we don't get the befriend because the befriend doesn't help us. Befriend just makes us vulnerable, more vulnerable. So we don't try no. and befriend. We are either looking for a way to get out or looking, what can I take and lick you on your head and run away? It's, 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 so there's that as well. But I absolutely take on board that for, that looking at mice and looking at white women, they could find that other thing, yeah. that third thing. Yeah. But I don't know, I'd like to see, yeah. um, I'd like to see them do that experiment with women of colour as well and see what happens with, with, with that. I mean, I would agree with you. I mean, I've got going through uh, some... But also, you know, in racism, you know, maybe it's for the white women to tend and befriend instead of running or fighting. Um, you know, it's maybe time for, 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 the, for the white people to, to you know, there's three, there's three actions. The black people are either going to run or fight. It's like, you know, it's up to us to do the tending and befriending. And it's like, you know, one of the things that I found really interesting since the book, you know, writing the book was what um, Ali Owen said the other day, which is as, as a white person, I'm a recovering racist because we were brought up, we were brought up in a, in a racist society. We were brought up with racist attitude. And no matter how much we say that we're not racist, there are parts of us that are racist. And, you know, and we, we should be actually humble enough to go, I'm a recovering racist. I know I'm a recovering racist. Yes, I, my, um, um, Ava, my white friend, I like this. <laughs> I've got another white friend who, when she heard that term, she went, that's the one! I'm a recovering racist! <laughs> yeah, I think it's it's a lot for people to admit, like, in the race yeah. thing. I mean, people will get their back up immediately when they hear that word and just don't want to discuss it. I do agree with you, like, in, you know, we have to be intersectional, because when I heard end and befriend, I was like, you no absolute never you know I think you try that when you're younger and you realize it's not it doesn't work not going to be your friend do not leave yourself open and it's not just white women you know there's anti-blackness in other races as well and I'm going yes. through it at the moment with somebody where I'm just thinking actually this person has killed my trust in people so badly like before I was quite open now I think absolutely not I will have to, you know, like you said, you're looking for something to lick him in the head with things. Get away from me. Get yes. away from me. I'm not going to make that yes. mistake again. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, gosh, 
once we're coming up to the end. I, this went so quickly. I know, when, I can't believe it. I just, I just looked at the time and said, when did time reach that time? Yeah. Well, as, you know, Carol and I were saying, you know, we actually have a rule that we don't pick up the phone to each other unless we've got two hours. got two hours. hours. Yeah. I've got to start doing that because I'm I'm going through the stage of my life where time management, I've got to do better. <laughs> and I thought that is a point that some people yeah. I should not pick up the phone to yeah. or say to them, I cannot pick up the phone to because it's not going to be a conversation. Because yeah. I'm tending to find like um, me with friends around my, we have longer conversations now about lots and lots of different things. Um, I think- We don't even have the conversation. We just don't answer the phone. Yeah, yes. so if it goes through to voicemail, it's like Carol, ring me back when she's got a couple of hours yes. to spare. And if I'm if I'm free, I'll answer it. If not, you know, there's no, you know, oh, you know, she'll be offended or oh, I haven't got in touch with her. It was like, no. Nah. I was, love that rule, though. I think that's an absolutely great rule. Yeah. Okay, so. what I want to ask you guys, to sort of finish up on. I was doing a panel and we were talking about oh god, I think it was at the Nasty Women Festival. I know that you guys oh. like that expression. <laughs> No, I like it actually. <laughs> Let's no, not go. No, I was saying, I know you guys mentioned in the book about being called nasty women. Is oh, no, I said, we're saying that's a lot better than what we used to be called. No, yeah, that's what, and yeah. No problem with being called nasty women. It was like, that's nothing compared to hairy legged exactly, fucking feminists. Exactly. <laughs> but there, there is a nasty woman festival mm. that had just started. So I was on a panel there and um, we were talking about sexism and stuff. And this woman just turned around and she went like, what about the men? And I, li I had to just buy, well, I nearly went, shut up, what? just shut up. Right, but I did, I was more polite about it. I tend to find, like, it was quite interesting, like her attitude to me. So I, like, I don't know if you ever saw me on Channel 4 News with my daughter now, who's five, but like I have, I was like, with this little girl, I just was taking her absolutely everywhere with me. She would go on stage with me when I was doing my stand up sets. And when she was like five weeks old, she'd be in a little car seat on the stage. And it, like I'm doing, so I found this woman's attitude to be a little bit patronized. She was going, oh, well, you know, you're not gonna find that later. I was like, this is the young kid. Like this is the last that I've got, it's not my first child. So I know that they do go to school and I know what happens later. But she, the point where I really wanted just to reach around and jump her was when she said, we'll be we talking about, she was like, now what about men? Well, men need our love as well. We've got to include men. I mean, where do you ladies stand on that? I mean, in terms, I have a son as well. So it's really interesting because I remember when he was younger, he was about, he would have been leaving primary school. And I went out with him and his friends. We went to get like coffee and they had their milkshakes and stuff. And they were, they went on that PGL thing they all go on. Um, <laughs> That, that, that week in Wales and they came back. And so him and his little friend, um, I won't say his name because I don't want to embarrass the boy, but he said, like, um, can I just ask you something? Well, we went um, on the trip and we bought the girl sweets and the girl smiled at us and took the sweets and they ran off and they wouldn't even talk to us afterwards. Like, what, what can we do? What can we do? And my son turned around and he went, for goodness sake, she's a feminist. She won't help us. <laughs> well, he's right, I'm actually not gonna help you and I don't care, I'm good on those girls. But I mean, what do you think? I mean, in terms of speaking- I love yesterday, there was a tweet up yesterday, which was fantastic. It was like, wow, there must be an amazing crash at, at Wembley. All of those men that are 30 and have got small families, you know, they, and that, Wembley must have been really taking care of their kids. And I just was like, I just absolutely adored that. But, you know, it was like, nobody ever questions that, you know, a stadium full of men can, can, can be there and nobody would even think of what would happen to their kids. And oh. so, you know, again, I think this sort of like, let's, let's make the, sarc you know, sarcasm is a great, and it's a, a, a yeah. brilliant British tradition, but we should be doing that all the time. It was like, you know, um, you know, call them up on their privilege, call them yeah. up on their privilege. I use that a lot. And definitely, I think it was also mentioned like uh, babysitting. Mm. You don't babysit your own kids, mate. No. Kids, they, you're not babysitting. But I think, like, my son is kind of, I've been a bit harsh, but I mean, what, what would you say our responsibility as women, or do you think we have any responsibility 
towards men. I mean, my thing is definitely to say, you know, speak to my son around consent and around the way you speak to women mm -hmm. and the way, you know, you don't disrespect like a woman's the way she wants to dress, all those kind of things. Do you think we have any responsibility to them? And do you think we have any responsibility to men in general? Or is it just like, sometimes men will come to me, I'll go, you've got, I've got my own annoying son. Please remove yourself. I'm not answering this. Go to your mum. Leave me alone. Like you have your own mother. I, I can't take on. What do you think our responsibility is in educating men on the subject of ageism? Well, I, th I think if we're growing them, if they are ours and we're growing them, we have a responsibility to teach them the things they need to know, as you were saying, you know, about consent, about um, the fact that women are as good as them. So all this other stuff you're hearing outside here, let's, let's bring that in, bring it home, come bring it home. Let's dismantle that shit now and let's have a look at that. Does that make sense to you, boy? Do you know what I mean? So teach, teach them that way, teach them through things that are happening in the world. Mm -hmm. Big man now though, that was his mother's job. Yeah, that's how I feel. And I'm not going to- One of the things I find- Go on, Jay. One of the things I find um, is young white men are worrying that they're not going to get in the careers and, and the job opportunities that they used to have. And my response to them is, you're actually going to have to work 10 times harder, mm -hmm. and which, you know, black people and, and women have been told forever. But it was like, you know, you're the, actually the first generation of men that are going to have to work to be 10 times better than your black counterpart or your female counterpart. And I saw this absolutely beautifully. It was like at the end of GCSEs and we were in McDonald's with my daughter. And one of the guys was like, oh, I'm really going to have to work hard next year if I'm going to, you know, you know, I've, I've really got to like pull up my game like this. And, um, and you know, and, and one of the guys, you know, said, well, well you, you know, well, you don't really work hard. He was like, no, no, I do work hard. And he just went as hard as the girls. <laughs> and they all just went, oh, none of us work as hard as the girls. And so guys really do, you know, from this young age, they've got to be, you actually, you're not going to cruise on your white maleness anymore. And anybody that's teaching you that you are going to is doing you a massive disservice. And so for everybody that was told you've got to work 10 times harder, actually now, young white men, you do have to work 10 times harder. So don't moan. Just, yeah. just get on with it and work as hard as the girls, work as hard as the black people. Yeah, yeah. we've got a little bit of a way to go, um, definitely with that. But yeah. I do see, yeah, I see. Yeah, because the volatility, I, the volatility I see in the world right now, the, 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 the backlash that we're in, um, both around women and around um, ethnically diverse people, is I think because it's coming out of that realization that white men are going to have to work 10 times harder and they can see it they they feeling the change they are they are they're witnessing the change which is why they're holding on to people like trump yeah yeah exactly it's exactly and boris on. Mm. yes I, I and i was saying like the tories we were speaking basically about the culture war i was we had femi nylander on and we were there is no culture war. There, there actually is no culture war. Yeah. The Tories are changing everything so they can hold on to it. And I think it was I, not a man I really want to quote for obvious reasons, but Gandhi had said, that, you know, first say whatever, mm. then they laugh at you and then they get angry. And I think we're at the stage of anger where they yeah. really are holding on to stuff. But I definitely, I mean, I find I do it a lot through comedy as well, but I agree with Jane in terms of sarcasm. There was just a line that I just had to put the book down and laugh when you're being dry humped by your boss. <laughs> You like, you do that to John, please. He earns more. I thought that was so <laughs> you pay him more than me. <laughs> exactly. I thought it was excellent, lady. I could talk to you all day. I could. I really could. Um, I thought I'm like I said. I haven't finished the book. I've just got past the uh, Diane Abbott bit. I'm finding it just brilliant. If I didn't have a five year old, I would have finished this book already. Yeah. Um, I think it's amazing. It's invisible, invisible to invaluable. So I will put a link of where to get it. Um, thank you for writing it. It oh. really was needed for me at this time in my life. Definitely, definitely, definitely. And uh, I appreciate you ladies so, so much. And thank you for agreeing to come on to Black Woman's Hour.
And um, hopefully we can have you back again. And maybe Aisha can have you to do her 10 questions at some yes. point. Yes, we'd love that. So Let's if you want to hang on, I'll just say bye to the audience and then uh, say bye to you after. So thank you for watching Black Woman's Hour. We will be back again and we will be speaking about deaths in custody and the possibility of, thank goodness, it might be possible that a policeman will be convicted of killing a black man for the first time since 1968. So that will be our next show. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, ladies. Bye, 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 bye.